Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Masakum Allah bil khair, Sayyidati Anisati Sadati. Welcome to KFAS Links. I'm Yusuf Al Mazidi. I am your host tonight. Uh, KFAS Links, the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences uh, Links program, is a distinguished speaker series that was launched in 2018. We've been doing spe speeches for two years. We had the pleasure to host many wonderful speakers from around the world since we started. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, our link series was halted for a few months, but returned last month to cover issues pertinent to KFAS's emergency resilience program uh, and the fight, the global fight of the COVID-19 pandemic. We hope to continue to hold KFAS link sessions every first Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. Uh, and all sessions are uploaded to our YouTube channel and made for uh, available for the public to view. Uh, you can in fact go to our YouTube channel and see from the very first uh, monthly session we've had until now some very interesting topics. Today, uh, it is my uh, pleasure, uh, distinguished honor, to welcome uh, Professor Alastair McGuire, uh, the chair of the health economics in the Department of Health Policy at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Prior to this, Professor McGuire was a professor of economics at City University London, if you allow me to, to introduce him for a minute, after being a tutor in economics at the University of Oxford. Uh, professor McGuire also was a visiting professor at Harvard University, the University of Sydney, the University of York, many, many others. He acted as advi an advisor to a number of governments and government bodies, including the UK government the UK Competition Commission, uh, the UK Medical Research Council, MRC, uh, as well as a number of international bodies, including the World uh, Bank, the World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and many pharmaceutical others. Today, we're very, very pleased to have uh, uh, this distinguished speaker with us, Professor Alistair McGuire, uh, has, has been with us uh, for a while. Our work with the London School of Economics health research goes back to uh, more than five years, to 2015, when KFAS started a, a multi-step project to review the healthcare system in Kuwait, uh, to propose strategic directions uh, for the future reform of the healthcare system in Kuwait from uh, an evidence-based perspective. Professor McGuire was present with us on the very first workshop we conducted. We hosted specialists from Kuwait that presented different healthcare systems in the world and he told us about lessons learned. Today, he joins us again with more lessons learned to talk about different healthcare systems uh, around the world navigated through the COVID-19 pandemic and the lessons learned from that. Uh, please do help me uh, welcome Professor McGuire virtually. Uh, there will be, uh, I will be listening, I'll be reading your questions as we go along. Uh, and if Professor McGuire sees the, the, the uh, urgency to answer them on the spot, he will otherwise we will collect them to the question and answer session. Uh, Professor McGuire, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yusuf. It's a great pleasure to be invited by KFAS to give this talk. And um, I hope a number of friends are listening, including uh, Dr. Amani, who um, I've met a number of times over the years. So I'm very pleased to uh, give this talk um, on COVID-19, unfortunately a disaster that's affected us globally. And I'll be talking about um, health care and economic responses. And I'll talk for um, about a minute. I'll, I'll try to go as fast as I can without losing people because I've got, there is a lot to say. Um, that, and then there'll be space for questions afterwards. Um, I want to give a bit of a global background to uh, the pandemic and stress where Kuwait is uh, globally. I want to say a little bit about um, mortality differences across countries. And then I'll talk a little bit about some uh, personal research I've been involved in with some hospitals in London, um, essentially to model their capacity flows of patients. And then I want to widen out again to talk a little bit about uh, the cost of the lockdown and then uh, say a little bit more about the economic implications of the lockdown as I'm an economist by background, um, so I'll come back to economics at the end. So that's the outline of the lecture. Um, I think it's um, an interesting time just now, as you can see from um, 
this uh, first slide. Uh, the slide has a timeline uh, on the right hand side of the, well, left hand side as you look at it, um, from March through to June uh, on the diagrams. And the diagram on the top essentially breaks down uh, the number of deaths uh, associated with COVID-19 across the world and various regions of the world. Uh, the Middle East, for example, is down towards the bottom initially uh, in the light green with Iran with its particular problem in darker green. Uh, but as you can see, the pandemic grows over time as we move towards the present day. Um, and unfortunately, we have over 700,000 uh, deaths worldwide. Uh, just to put that into some perspective, uh, the recent influenza um, outbreak of 2019-2020 only had 25,000 deaths. Um, within the United States, there's uh, over 140,000 deaths attributed to COVID, and that's more deaths than have occurred uh, within the US attributable to Vietnam, Afghan, and the Iraqi wars in total. So it's having a devastating impact on individual countries and globally. The graphic uh, below the main graph um, on the left-hand side is the percentage of deaths as they're spread across the globe. And again, you can see these percentages change over time. Essentially, the blue um, uh, areas are the European Union deaths. Uh, they start off fairly high initially. Um, and EU mortality was about 80 percent of all the deaths attributable to COVID in March. That's down to about 5% globally now. Um, there's uh, some tracking and recording issues, of course, in terms of these deaths. But in essence, um, the global pandemic is spreading across the world and different parts of the world, Latin America in particular now, are being affected differentially at different points in time. I would say that um, if you look at the top graphic, you can see that the uh, number of deaths is starting to spread out again, and that's partly attributable to the increased number of deaths in Latin America in particular um, and the United States. Um, for a number of the data, I'll use um, two particular sources. Um, the Financial Times has been bringing data together from uh, various sources in a very user-friendly manner. And it's the Financial Times um, uh, figure that I'm going to, a graphic that we're looking at now. Um, and I'll say a little bit about this graphic because uh, I'll use similar graphics throughout the presentation. On the uh, vertical axis, if you look at the vertical axis on the left-hand side, of the diagram, you'll see that that's in a logarithmic scale. So you'll see that the scale's compressed over time, uh, compressed itself in the sense that as you get larger numbers, there's smaller and smaller differences on the axis. And that reflects, of course, the exponential rise in this uh, uh, terrible disease. And on the uh, bottom axis, on the horizontal axis, um, normally, we're going to see the number of days since the beginning of the infection, where the beginning of the infection is uh, normally recorded with regards to uh, a, a small number of either deaths or cases being recorded. So on the vertical axis, we have logarithmic scale. Um, so it's uh, compressing the numbers. And on the um, horizontal or the x-axis, we have time. And uh, there are a number of countries highlighted here. Each of these gray um, uh, graphs show different individual countries. I've highlighted a number of countries. This particular graphic looks at the uh, cumulative COVID-19 deaths in terms of actual numbers. So it's just a count of numbers. And you can see that the United States is um, growing very rapidly initially, and then um, leveling off. But cumulatively, it's um, still increasing, but at a much slower rate. And 
I've highlighted Kuwait in blue always in these graphs. Uh, and as you can see, the cumulative number is much smaller. Remember that the vertical axis is a logarithmic scale. So um, the number for Kuwait is uh, relatively small compared to a number of other countries. However, I don't want you to get too complacent uh, about this within Kuwait, because if we um, put the numbers into uh, the cumulative deaths per million population, and that's a bit unfair for Kuwait when we're comparing it to the United States, for example, or, um, because Kuwait has a much smaller population than the United States, obviously. But uh, if we do rebase these cumulative deaths into uh, per population, so taking account of the size of the population, you can see that Kuwait then jumps above Egypt, for example, and comes out as being a sort of middling country in terms of uh, COVID deaths um, globally. Uh, the US and the United Kingdom are still way out above, and Iran, of course, is um, has suffered the COVID pandemic much longer. So you can see that Iran uh, in terms of cumulative deaths, it goes out further than Kuwait because they started earlier. But Kuwait is kind of edging towards Iran's number. So I, I think I, I've put this graph in, um, in terms of per million population, really to emphasize that even Kuwait, where the absolute numbers are low, should not be complacent about uh, COVID at all uh, in terms of where it is globally. Um, this next graph, again, has a logarithmic scale on the left-hand side and a timeline on the um, horizontal axis. Kuwait's again in blue. Um, and these are the new or the incident uh, COVID death rates over time. So the recording of new deaths on a rolling basis. Normally, again, these uh, graphics are based on a five or seven day rolling basis to even out any particular uh, sharp increases or falls on a particular day. Uh, and there have been problems with weekends in particular where the counting is not particularly good within countries. So doing it on a rolling basis sort of averages things out. As you can see, uh, the new deaths for uh, Kuwait um, are fairly level. There might be just about a small uh, decrease over time, but it's kicked up recently. Uh, these figures will not include um, the end of Eid, for example. They'll include the beginning of Eid, and that might explain some of the sharp increase in the Kuwaiti figures uh, uh, in the most recent past. But they're leveling. I wouldn't say they're declining fast, um, these new deaths within Kuwait. And again, if we put these into... Um, a per million population base, you can see that um, Kuwait then jumps up above a number of countries, including Europe and Egypt. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way aspect here. Kuwait is a relatively small population compared to the European Union or even Egypt, um, but it accounts for the size of the population and therefore, again, it uh, takes away any complacency that some people may have that things in Kuwait are better than elsewhere. Um, so I, I think the other thing to notice is that uh, there were early peaks in some countries like Iran or the United States and then sharp declines. But then, of course, uh, Iran in particular has seen an increase again. It may be because of uh, better recording. It may uh, partly reflect that. And the United States has had uh, an increase again over time, uh, reflecting largely the drift of the pandemic down to the south and western states in the United States. So I think it's quite important also to recognize, as I've said a couple of times in passing, that there are uh, problems with the data collection. And the, I'll come back to that uh, problem of data collection later on. But essentially, it's about how to ascertain the correct level of deaths um, attributable to uh, COVID. And um, what some countries have begun to do for two reasons is 
count excess mortality rather than just COVID deaths alone. Um, and the two reasons for doing that are, first of all, the reporting issues with COVID deaths themselves. And secondly, that as countries' healthcare systems have relocated themselves to deal with COVID, it may be that there are implications for other diseases, diabetes, heart attacks, for example, or even cancer, and people who would have had access to faster treatment for these diseases are now being blocked because the resources are going towards COVID. And so you're seeing mortality in other disease areas as well. And so countries have started looking at excess mortality, where the excess on the graphic on the left is for a number of countries. Um, and these uh, countries are showing the excess mortality in uh, red over time. Uh, so the bottom axis for each of these countries is in calendar time. And the gray line on each of these countries' graphics is a historical average of mortality for these calendar dates. So it's taken usually um, five years mortality rates for these dates running from January to um, uh, December. And then it's looked at the excess mortality, which has been counted over the COVID period. So um, as I said, a number of countries have been doing that because they want to ensure that they're collecting um, appropriate mortality statistics, uh, which may be both directly attributable to COVID deaths, but also indirectly attributable as the deaths may be occurring outside the hospital sector as cancer patients or heart disease patients um, don't get access to the care that they should have done because of the blockages caused by uh, COVID. And um, to illustrate that further, um, this is uh, 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 a graphic which looks at, in this case on the left-hand uh, axis, it's the number of deaths per 100,000 population. So again, it's um, calibrating for the population size of the countries. And it's uh, got calendar time on the horizontal axis. The blue, uh, fig the blue uh, graph here, the blue line, is the UK. And you can see that the UK's number of deaths per 100,000 population is um, above the United States and well above the United States up to the end of June. Of course, the United States starts to catch up very rapidly with the UK. So this is a little bit out of date now, um, but the UK has been doing particularly badly. And I've put this um, slide in because it uh, illustrates exactly the arguments that have just been given, uh, that the UK not only has a high COVID death rate, but that restructuring or recalibrating of healthcare towards treating COVID patients has impacted on other healthcare within the UK health system. So in April, uh, taking April as a snapshot, uh, cancer assessment, so the, the basic diagnosis for cancer, were down 60% in the UK in April 2020 compared to one year previous. April 29. Routine operations for surgery, essentially elective op operations, were down 85% in April 2020 compared to April 2019. Uh, again, because of the, um, the COVID restructuring of treatment. The uh, trace and testing results, the testing and tracing results um, were not particularly good and may explain this fairly high uh, death rate within the UK po population because they were unable to contact 33% of those who had tested positive um, after the test had been given in, and they were unable within the UK to test 15% of the contacts. Uh, in fact, uh, a national tracing app uh, was delayed because it couldn't uh, measure um, geographical distance very, distance very efficiently, which of course made the idea of um, testing um, and tracing people quite difficult. 
And in fact, although it has been introduced now, uh, various regions within the UK are introducing their own tracing app because the national one is not particularly good. I'll come back to testing again throughout this talk. But it obviously has an implication uh, in terms of the uh, both the cases that you're counting and the uh, deaths that you're counting. So within the UK, we've seen 57% uh, higher excess deaths um, uh, than we have in the average of the last five years. Um, COVID directly attributable deaths are about 41,000. Um, excess deaths are about 64,000. And I also want to point out here that um, there was a counting issue within the UK. Initially, the UK was only counting COVID deaths within the hospital sector, but then there was a very large uh, impact on of COVID on the social care sector. So uh, homes for the elderly, for example, were hit particularly hard in England, and yet they were only counting COVID deaths in the hospital sector initially and not in the social care sector. So there was a bit of a mismatch in terms of how they were counting who had actually directly died as a result of COVID within the UK. Again, I'll come back to that later as well. If we move from deaths onto cases, uh, I think uh, it's quite interesting as well, because again, we've got uh, similar FT graphics here on the um, vertical axis. Again, we're uh, We've got counts, but again, remember they're in logarithmic scale, so they're compressing the numbers. And we've got days since uh, the start of the the epidemic. Um, something's happened to my screen there. I'm not sure what. Uh, days since the start of the epidemic on the um, x-axis, the horizontal axis. Um, there are now more than 18 million cases uh, confirmed on the 5th of August. Um, that's to be contrasted with the 2019-20 influenza number of cases. There were 18 to 25 million cases. So you can tell from that that the case fatality rate, which I'll come back to as well, so the fatality rate, the death rate from COVID is much higher than it is from normal flu. Um, it's also the, the true that the healthcare systems generally are expecting influenza to some degree to hit any healthcare system, so they're ready for it. Whereas um, the uh, uh, COVID-19, of course, was a completely unexpected um, uh, impact on these uh, these um, these uh, hospitals. Um, Again, uh, Kuwait is in the blue here. You can see that the cumulative cases are um, uh, somewhere around the middle end, top, towards the top end of um, uh, uh, global responses. But although your confirmed cases have been fairly high, and that partly reflects your uh, testing ability, you put in place fairly good testing procedures in Kuwait. Um, it also reflects somehow that uh, the mortality seems to be lower in Kuwait, uh, given the higher number of cases than some of the other countries. And again, I'll come back to that um, uh, in a moment. If we uh, then recalibrate as usual by taking account of the population uh, and looking at the cases, the cumulative cases, per million population across uh, countries, in particular looking at um, uh, individual countries. Again, just so that you're not getting complacent, you can see that um, the uh, Kuwait situation looks fairly um, much towards the top end um, because of uh, the rebasing into the per million population. It's fairly um, unfair, as I say, because Kuwait is such a smaller country compared to the uh, US. Um, so I think that's um, a relatively unfair comparison, but it, it's there again just to make sure that you're not being complacent. Um, I'm just sending the administrator a, a message here. Um, 
and certainly Kuwait is well above uh, Egypt uh, in this, this particular case. The new confirmed cases um, are, uh, again, uh, you can see this is just the number on the y-axis, uh, again, logarithmic scale with uh, time on the bottom from the first incidents. Uh, I've added China in here because it's quite important, um, but you can see that, for example, with um, China, you, you get a very sharp peak initially, falls off dramatically, you have another small peak, and then it starts uh, going up towards a, a, a third peak um, just laterally, and that's quite uh, important. Um, and I think that's um, important because it shows that the pandemic is um, not just having one peak. It's not localized to one particular area or region within China, for example. It's spread out across China. Um, and the transmission starts again. And there's uh, possibly a second wave within China now. And that's even before we get to the traditional uh, seasonal, seasonal or winter few, uh, influenza um, uh, issues. So it may be that we're seeing a second wave and possibly even a third wave is going to take account, um, uh, going to occur in China. And of course, China was one of the first, was the first country to be hit by the pandemic. So what's happening in China may be a kind of precursor to what's going to happen elsewhere globally. Um, so it, that's this is quite a worrying uh, um, slide, I think. Again, if we look at new deaths, um, so the last slide was cases, now we're looking at deaths. Um, you can see the Chinese uh, peak in blue has uh, peaked initially, gone down, flattened out, and now the deaths are, cr are rising again. As I showed in a much earlier slide, the Kuwaiti death rate is kind of falling, but maybe level it, leveling off. But I think um, you have to look at the left-hand slide, slide, uh, left uh, axis again on this slide, uh, remembering that it's logarithmic in scale. And note that, for example, at the end of the period for Kuwait, Kuwait has about 500 new cases, but only four new deaths whereas China has about uh, 100 cases, but only two new deaths right at the end. So if you take the last point on the slide for China and Kuwait and look at these, you see that the case, um, new cases and the deaths are kind of strange. Um, so the case fatality record is, uh, rate is uh, differing across countries. So I think that's uh, quite interesting. I think it's interesting because case fatality rates differ not only at the early stage of um, of uh, a disease because you've got less reliable data, but also um, because you may have bad recording of data, you may not have testing, and the contact tracing may not be reliable. So getting real figures on case fatality is quite difficult. And again, I'll come back to that in a moment. But just to give you an example, let's have an example where we have 100 people infected with COVID-19, 10 are uh, infected severely enough to go to hospital where they're tested and they all test positive and one dies. 90 others who are less severely ill but have caught COVID stay at home without testing and 99 survive. Well, under those circumstances, the case fatality rate would be one in 10, one hospital patient of the 10 who are tested in hospital, 10%. But the true infection fatality rate is one in 100, 1%. And uh, that's quite important because testing regimes differ in um, their content. Different testing regimes uh, may be based on random testing of the population or systematic testing of the population. So within the UK, we have random testing currently, but New Zealand had systematic testing. And uh, we have to differentiate in testing across uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic cases as well. And we may have higher or lower percentage testing of 
uh, the population coverage. And all of that means that the different testing regimes are going to affect the number that's returned as the case fatality rate. Um, and all that we do know is that testing does vary quite enormously across countries. So, for example, as I said, here we've got the test co conducted per confirmed case of COVID. We've got on the left hand side, we've got a log scale again and dates are along the bottom on the X axis, the horizontal axis. New Zealand has had a fairly systematic testing regime across the population. Others have, uh, like the UK have increased their testing, but their testing has been only random um, in the population. And you can see that Kuwait is uh, towards the um, sort of middle bottom end of the testing regime um, per confirmed case, partly because it has lower uh, caseload, of course, but um, also um, because its um, testing regime has begun gone to become systematic but didn't start off as such. So different tests give rise to different outcomes, different testing regimes give rise to different outcomes and these different outcomes are reflected in the case fatality rates which we're trying to use to compare across countries remember. Um, why is the testing important? Well it affects the dynamics of the infection. On this slide we've got on the first line that delta, that little triangle, is the rate of change in the infected population. And that rate of change in the infected population is equal to um, the contact rate, that beta, uh, the contact rate in the susceptible population as it impacts within the infected population. And then we take out the, I don't know why my slides sometimes jump. They do. Um, so the rate of change in the infected population is the contact rate within the susceptible population as it affects the infected population. And then, of course, we have to net out the recovery rate in the um, infected population itself. And the um, reproduction number, the rate, if you like to think of it as that, of, uh, uh, of reproduction of the infection in the population is essentially the, um, especially, um, I don't know why somebody seems to be moving my slides, um, especially um, the reproduction rate is the rate at which the infection is reproducing in the population and that's obviously the um, uh, affected by the contact rate relative to the recovery rate and if that's greater than one the infection rate in the population increases. For Kuwait you're round about one just now. The best evidence we have is that the reproduction number is about 0.9 to 1.1. Uh, those are the latest figures I have. It may have slightly improved uh, recently, um, but you're still well within the danger zone. On top of the um, uh, infection, the recovery rate and the contact rate, um, the infection in the population is also impacted upon the, um, the lockdown rate. And the lockdown rate can be given by this uh, parameter theta squared. The theta squared gives rise to the idea that um, we have some exponential character in the inf infection, which is why we're using these logarithmic um, elements in the, uh, the graphics, of course. And then the, the delta, the rate of change in the infection rate, is not only associated with the contact rate, but also the lockdown rate, as well as the recovery rate. And the, the important thing here is that these, uh, reproduction numbers are modeled and the modeling depends upon how time is treated and the way in which a model treats time will be dependent on the average duration of exposure and the average average duration of the latent infection state so for example you could take the average as a mean you could take the average as a median you could take the duration of exposure as longer or shorter and so the reproduction number itself, as it's modeled, 
is partly a reflection of the assumptions that go into the models. So even looking at um, the reproduction number itself is quite difficult. Um, mortality rates, of course, are, are um, not highly correlated with the case rate and they tend to di differ across countries. So if you think about it, the, you'd expect with higher uh, case rates, you'd have higher mortality, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, that might be because of uh, certain definitional problems that mortality is uh, subject to ascertainment bias. So the actual um, ascertainment of the cause of death uh, gives you the mortality rate for COVID. But of course, we do know that um, certain systems leave it to clinicians to ascertain how the patient died. Even when patients have a number of comorbidities, they put down a primary um, cause of mortality. And we know that COVID patients in particular have a wide range of comorbidities, and these comorbidities may be affecting the signal of the uh, mortality rate. So again, a quick example, we know if we compare Italy and China, that the overall case fatality rate in mid-March was uh, 7.2 in Italy and 2.3 in China, uh, which is fairly surprising given uh, the high case rate in China. Um, but for individuals aged between 0 and 69, so newborns to 69, the case fatality rate was very, ch very similar. But for those aged uh, in the elderly, 70 to 79, it was a case fatality rate of 12.8% in Italy and 8% in China. And for uh, those over 80, it was 20% in Italy and 14% in China. And we've no real an answers as to why the fatality rates for the same disease are changing across countries. We don't really understand that. It's a new disease. We have no understanding of why different case fatality rates are being seen. We do know, as I've stressed throughout, that there's a problem with the data collection. There's a problem with testing. If you have different testing regimes, as I've said before, you're going to have different uh, denominators in your case fatality rate. But we don't really understand uh, what's going on with the case fatality rate. Also, um, we know that uh, the healthcare system responses have um, been different across countries, so that may account for some uh, differences in mortality rates. China, of course, was hit first of all. There was an underreporting of cases of an unknown disease, as it was then, initially, and they that overwhelmed the hospital sector. And indeed, if you know about the Chinese hospital sector, there are essentially three levels of hospitals in China, uh, levels one, two, and three, reflecting different qualities of health care treatment. And most of the COVID patients were trying to go to the highest quality uh, hospitals, not surprisingly, and those hospitals simply got overwhelmed. In Iran, the hospital capacity was uh, simply too low to cope with the influx of the disease, as was the case in Italy as well, where it wasn't particularly the hospitals so much uh, which were unprepared for the high influx of patients, but the intensive care units or the intensive therapy units, the high uh, critical care units, there weren't enough critical care beds within uh, the northern regions of Italy to uh, cope with the high influx of this, um, these pandemic um, patients. The UK quickly adapted within its healthcare se sector by reallocating some beds to become critical care beds. Um, so there was a recalibration of uh, normal beds within the UK to critical care beds. Normally, critical care beds have one nurse to each patient, but very quickly the UK re reacted by having one nurse to five or six patients. So not only did they recalibrate the beds, they also recalibrated the staffing. However, there was a lack of personal protective equipment. There was a lack of masks um, for staff. So we saw a high uh, mortality rate amongst uh, certain staff in certain hospitals. And there was a lack of integration within the social care uh, 
um, sector so that some patients who were in hospital at the beginning of the epidemic were discharged into the social care sector and spread the disease amongst the elderly in care homes. And so we saw increased mortality there. Across South America and certain regions of the United States, we know that, that they have much more fragmented healthcare systems. So they don't have integrated healthcare systems. And they certainly were lacking, particularly in South America, in, in some of the uh, countries, Ecuador stands out, Brazil as well. Uh, there's complete lack of capacity to deal with these, um, these uh, cases. We also know that staffing numbers uh, were particularly low in many countries and nursing staff in particular, although there are some problems in particular countries with, um, with uh, hospital staff. Um, another thing that, uh, so I want to now to step back from the, the global idea and look at the hospital flows and say a little bit about um, how to model hospital flows within a sector. We have quite a lot of um, information at the national level. We have quite a lot of information at the local level, but where we don't have much information is in hospital planning for local hospitals. So we've been building a, a hospital model within the LSE, and that's freely available to anybody who contacts me. I'll put you in touch with um, our, our researchers there. I'm one of them, but if you contact me, I can give you the model. It runs through Excel. It predicts levels of demand as you move through different levels of care as patients come into the emergency department, ED, and as patient infections and external referral pathways change. And what the, the model is attempting to do is move us towards a um, modeling of how best to use capacity or where capacity constraints will be hit by various influxes of, of patients over time. Now, as you can uh, imagine, in the UK, we, we were doing this for a, a large hospital, which uh, serves about 600,000 population in London, Guy's and St. Thomas's. It's actually where the Prime Minister ended up in the UK um, for a short period of time. But the, uh, the timeline with which we were trying to model hospital planning was extremely con constrained. And in fact, uh, the data flows to get data in on a daily basis to try to model out uh, the constraints was extremely difficult as well. Um, the, the model had to be flexible to incorporate new data and it had to deal with uncertainty, whilst at the same time, of course, because you're dealing with daily changes in patient level data, it had to be, be confidential as well. So the model itself essentially looks at the uh, presentation of patients into the emergency department, how that changes over time and where these patients go and attempts to uh, model at each level of care, each level of treatment, what the capacity constraints are, beds, staffing, um, uh, the ventilators, for example. So it tries to model capacity constraints as a patient flows COVID patient flows through the system. And at each of uh, six phases in the treatment, um, there is uh, some capacity constraint, which then brings the patient into the next uh, consideration. The staffing requirements were based on level of care and uh, number of uh, staff per bed or per patient. And of course, we needed to do this on an updated daily basis. So we did it on a daily time basis but you could look at this in even finer slices of time if you had uh, available data. So th this is a kind of graphic representation where you have the number of detected cases on module one coming into the hospital. So we're not dealing with the epidemiological uh, modeling. There's a lot of epidemiological modeling just now, but there's hardly any modeling of hospital flows. So we were looking at how to take the, the cases that turn up at the emergency uh, room and then are managed within a hospital and then are discharged to, through recovery or discharged to death. Um, and within the hospital, we were looking at ward occupancy rates, the ICU rates, transfers across wards, 
the um, treatment rates, ventilators, uh, RRT is uh, renal replacement therapy, uh, ECMO of course is for the kidney disease which is affected by um, for the more severely ill patients and then we need to, to have the de daily dis discharge rates as well. So we, we were taking cases as they turned up in the emergency department modeling through the hospital um, until discharge or death. And that itself turned into quite a difficult problem. Here we've got uh, the arrivals at the emergency department, the small embedded graph, the graph with the, um, the uh, blue up in the left hand corner, the blue is actually the uh, daily arrivals of patients. But when you put it into a longer time scale, so not just the initial time scale for the data that we're working with, you can see that that blue could go on to be forecast to be any form of arrival distribution. So we had to build in different, different, different distributions into the modeling flow of these patients, which we did, um, and forecast them through. And then each day we had to recalibrate to see uh, how the model was doing with regards to the prediction of the distribution. And once, and that was only the, uh, the start of that uh, model, so the admission day, what sort of uh, distribution of arrivals we were going to get. And then they had to flow through this um, hospital system in terms of um, basically whether they were admitted to a particular level of care, L1, or admitted directly to critical care. If they were in uh, level one, what length of stay they had. Uh, if they weren't treated well enough, did they have to go into critical care? And so was the care um, escalated at any point of time? And then within each of these uh, decisions, if you look at the box on the bottom left-hand side, you see left length of stay for level one care, we'd have to change the patterns as more information became available. So even taking an individual hospital, which was admitting uh, about at its peak, about uh, 60 patients uh, during its peak, uh, was very difficult to model out where the capacity constraints were going to, to uh, flow. In the end, we uh, modeled the um, the admissions, the top left diagram shows you the admissions. It was a log normal distribution, essentially seemed to model it. We had occupancies modeled. We had um, the bottom um, left-hand diagram gives you the discharge rate from different wards and from the hospital itself over time. And the bottom right-hand uh, Output gives you the tracheotomies and the renal replacement therapies, which were modeled over time for those more severely ill. So it was an attempt to try to model through the flow of cases at an individual hospital level, which um, I'm showing you because it's extremely difficult to do um, because the low numbers initially make it very difficult to forecast the turn up rate and then moving people through is very difficult to do. Um, so uh, that said, um, uh, I think we're back one. That said, it's extremely difficult to plan capacity utilization, but that's precisely what uh, treatment um, has to do if, if we're going to um, uh, really deal with this disease. The, diff the real difficulty was getting the data. So collecting and collating data at the local level is extremely important, but it's impossible to get daily uptakes it's, uh, within any healthcare system. And that's something which I think um, is gonna be a lasting impact of this. Of this. I want to move now on to um, uh, the economic aspects of uh, uh, what's happening as well. I'll come back to some of the other aspects later on, but I want to look at whether um, the benefits of lockdown were um, greater than the costs of lockdown. And that touches on the notions of um, the value of a statistical life, the estimates of willingness to pay for a change in probability, um, 
And of course, if we're putting a monetary value on a, a life a probability of death, then we need to know the probability of death from COVID. That means that we need to have good estimates of the case fatality rate. But already I've said that we don't really know what the true case fatality rate is because it varies on uh, the testing ideas. However, we we could make some estimates of the true f case fatality rate. Uh, if you remember right at the beginning of this epidemic, there were a number of cruise ships which became infected. Uh, the Diana Princess was one. It was off the coast of China, uh, Japan rather. It had 3,711 passengers and 750 individuals were affected. It's quite an interesting lab case, if you like, because people who take uh, these global cruises tend to be the elderly. So it's a good reflection of um, the highest at risk population. About eight of these uh, 750 people who got infected died. So there was a severe infection rate of about 20% a case fatality rate of about 1.3%. That's um, a fairly high infection rate. And in fact, if we looked at the early testing, the 10,000 tests, which had been undertaken in various countries by uh, the end of April, case fatality on average was about 4%, but that lay between 0.1 in Singapore and 14.6 in Belgium. And again, that reflected the various ways in which um, tests were being undertaken. So we want to estimate whether or not the monetary benefit of the lockdown is greater than the monetary cost. And the way in which we could do that is to take the infected population from that uh, cruise ship and the case fatality rate, so the 20% infection rate, and the 1% death rate, and apply it to populations. So here I've applied it to the United States and the United Kingdom. On the left-hand side is the example from the United States. Right-hand side is the United Kingdom. The United States, when they're looking at the probability of death for new public projects, so they're doing project appraisal work, and they put a monetary value on uh, a death, they then uh, attribute £10 million to each death as uh, uh, part of the project appraisals um, in 2016. So. We know by applying the infection rate to the US population of 328 million, infection rate 66 percent, uh, 66 million and 1 percent of those die. So we have about half, just over half a million dying. We apply the 10 million as a value of life. So without lockdown, the monetary value, without lockdown, because we're taking these case fatality rates from uh, an example in the cruise ship. So what would have happened? if we hadn't have had lockdown, um, the monetary value of life saved is about 6.5 trillion on the value of life if you take a 1% case for fatality or 13 trillion uh, with a 2%. If we net out the deaths that we already have from COVID under lockdown, you get a net monetary value of lockdown uh, in terms of life saved of about 5 trillion or eleven trillion at five trillion dollars at one uh, percent, uh, eleven trillion at two percent, could do the same for the UK. Uh, the UK uh, public policy uses much lower figures for a value of life, so the net monetary value of the life saved comes out to be about point uh, one six trillion, uh, one hundred sixty uh, million. Uh, uh, if you take the 1% fatality rate. We also know that COVID's had a massive impact on uh, economies for the U USA. The Congressional Budget Office says that the projections for the year 2020 are that we'll see a 3.9 trillion fall uh, in, in GDP attributable to COVID. So now we have an indicator where we have COVID in terms of its lockdown and the disease itself, but largely its lockdown has impacted on the US to the tune of uh, $3.9 trillion. But we've estimated that the value of life saved by the lockdown is 5.4 trillion. So that shows us that the lockdown in terms of monetary value of lives and the benefit gained then uh, through that was greater than the economic impact. On the other hand, if we look at the UK, 
if we take the public policy figures for the UK of a value of life at 0.16 trillion, they're very low. And the Office of Budget Responsibility, OBR, said there would be a 13% fall in um, the um, uh, value of the GDP affected by um, COVID. So we see that that, uh, that lockdown has not quite covered the value of life saved. So it's dependent upon what public policy levels of uh, value of your life saved are put at as to whether or not the lockdown's been uh, effective. Within the, the Kuwaiti circumstance, it's estimated there'll be about a 1.1% fall in your GDP. Um, so I'd imagine that the lockdown probably has greater economic benefit given any reasonable value of life. So your lockdowns, which you're currently experiencing, I think are quite important and also probably outweigh the impact in terms of pure GDP, uh, if it is 1.1% fall in GDP that you experience over the year associated with COVID. So um, I think there are um, issues coming out of this for Kuwait in particular, that the lockdowns I think are probably economically justified, uh, let alone for any other reason. I think there are, uh, you are seeing staff shortages uh, within your healthcare system. I think there are particular problems with migrant health versus incumbent population health, which need to be look at, looked at. And I think there are some f future issues which I'll raise towards the end associated particularly with uh, uh, vaccines. I think your external constraints are probably the biggest issues and uh, noted that you've um, just kick-started a, a food initiative for the UAE, uh, for the Gulf states, which um, I think is something which has been uh, coming for a number of years, but has been brought forward by the pandemic. Um, this slide just emphasizes uh, the percentage change on the vertical axis against uh, the horizontal axis, 1908 up to 2020. You can see that the COVID induced crisis is much stronger and much uh, larger than any other uh, fall in GDP that the UK has seen. And that goes for all countries within the OECD, the higher wealthier countries of the world, um, the, the impact is massive. You, uh, we've got uh, a huge 13% fall. It will probably be more than a 13% fall in our GDP over 2020 because we're still seeing rising cases and rising, rising death rates within the UK. And although we're beginning to come out of lockdown, we're seeing spikes in particular geographical areas, and these areas are being put back down into lockdown. So I suspect we're going to see a larger fall in GDP than even the 13% which we've already experienced. So this is massive um, uh, impact on GDP. Um, if you look at the OECD world GDP, so the uh, gross domestic product for the world, the, the green line here is an index uh, on the left-hand side and then a timeline on the uh, bottom horizontal index, uh, bottom ho horizontal axis rather. The green line gives us the um, prediction prior to COVID and then you get these red line with the purple one saying, well, if we only have one spike in infection, the that's what's happening to the decline in world GDP because of uh, COVID, if we have two spikes, the red line brings us down to uh, the double hit scenario. And in most cases, we don't see any recovery until 2025, even in the best case scenarios. And that's with countries already having spent somewhere between eight to nine trillion dollars in rescue packages. Okay, so we're seeing massive uh, hits to our economies globally. That has to be put into perspective because if you, these two slides show the amount of global debt uh, in the top figure, so it's a percentage of GDP on the uh, vertical axis, timeline on the horizontal axis, and that percentage of global debt is uh, the amount of debt uh, 
that we have uh, accumulated over the past um, uh, 40 years. And the bottom uh, slide gives us the percentage of GDP debt for gross government debt. So it's only the public sector debt. And as you can see, uh, public sector uh, debt is um, running for some countries, uh, including Japan, at about 250% of their GDP now. For the United States, it's 130 odd percent of their GDP. So most countries are going well above their level of GDP with regards to their government debt. Kuwait's in a much better position. It's only its fiscal balances are really good. It's only 25% of its GDP is uh, debt service. But for the the global uh, uh, issue is that we're in a world where COVID has come on top of global debt generally and government debt specifically, which has been rising for over um, uh, 40 years. And as you can see from this, this graph, the forecast is that uh, gross government debt as a percentage of GDP is that it will be 120% uh, in 2020. So, so uh, governments will be spending far more and having to service debt at a far higher level than their GDP. Um, and that's quite important because it means that both uh, governments and private debts also high, uh, means that the levels of bankruptcy in the world are going to uh, rocket and the governments will have to find ways of servicing this debt somehow. Um, and that also comes at a time when productivity globally has been low and um, the, the real wage of workers has not grown really since the last financial crisis that we had. So we've had, um, first of all, COVID. We then have rising uh, global and government debt and we've got low productivity, so we can't grow our way out of this. And we've got uh, uh, stabilized real wages. Um, so we've got a number of crises which have backed onto us. What, what does that mean? I mean, for me, I think the optimistic idea is essentially um, either we're going to see more fiscal st stimulus, interest rates are low, that's a problem for uh, trying to kickstart start, uh, any consumption, of course, we've got a liquidity problem, but uh, governments might say, well, because interest rates are so low, we'll kickstart fiscal stimulus, governments trying to put more money into the um, economies. But of course, as governments put more money in, the debt levels rise, and so the tax rises to pay for the debt, and that takes money out of consumption. There's definitely going to be changes in the labor market. I think that um, the labor market might move uh, over time towards four day weeks. There's certainly going to be more working from home, I think. Uh, on the healthcare sectors themselves, I think we're going to see greater moves towards uh, investments in both the healthcare sectors, but also social care sectors, because in a large number of countries in the world, we're seeing um, the social care sectors or the care sectors which service the elderly and in large number of countries demographies are saying uh, demographers are saying uh, aging in these countries so we need growing social care social care has tended to be forgotten in terms of social insurance so i think uh, particularly as the elderly elderly were hit hard with covid we're going to see more monies maybe moved over to the social care area we certainly need more public insurance funds for um, pandemics. The World Bank initiated a pandemic emergency financing facility in 2017 for developing countries, but that was eaten up within weeks of the COVID pandemic. And we also need to think about different ways in which to incentivize pandemic vaccine research, because obviously pandemics arise and occur uncertainly, so we can't plan out for a pandemic by its very nature. If you can't plan for a pandemic, there's little incentive for anybody to make treatments for that pandemic. And so I think we're going to see some moves towards pre-committing um, um, uh, funds 
um, for these pandemics uh, through public funding. So um, the conclusions, well, it, unfortunately, um, it's very difficult to say because we're right in the middle of this uh, pandemic as to what changes there are going to be in healthcare systems. I think some changes will occur. We'll see much more re the ability of uh, hospital systems in particular to recalibrate. We know that fragmented healthcare systems have done better than uh, non-fragmented, rather, that should read. Um, less fragmented healthcare systems have done better than fragmented ones in dealing with the pandemic. In the UN in uh, 2015 and then latterly in uh, 2019 uh, produced its UN sustainability goals for the world. The second one addressed healthcare and with healthcare, They've uh, been promoting universal healthcare coverage initially in 2025. Now it's being knocked back to 2030. And universal healthcare coverage, of course, says that within a country, everybody should be insured to a minimum basic standard for healthcare, and everybody should have access to healthcare. So I think that the pandemic has basically pushed that up the agenda. Uh, certainly, if you look back over the 21st century, we've had three con coronaviruses, um, SARS-203, MERS-2012, and now this one in 2019. So these pandemics seem to be occurring with more frequency. It's not sure to me whether that's because these genomic uh, diseases are because humans are encroaching on different ha animal uh, habitats or what for whatever reason, we're seeing more prevalence of these coronaviruses. The um, general aspects are testing is a key and tracing has to be supportive of testing, but the testing has to be done systematically, as in New Zealand. Jap Japan has come up with the notion of cluster busters, where uh, the data is collected in such a way that you can identify clusters immediately and identify within the clusters the infection spreaders. Uh, we might have less nursing in ITU wards, particularly in the UK, but I, I generally think that we're going to see more capacity build, uh, excess capacity held in reserve for pandemics, for example. No idea how the vaccines will play out. The vaccines, uh, there are currently um, about 20 front runner vaccines. There's 120 in, uh, potentially in development. If you think about how you're going to plan going forward in Kuwait, say a vaccine was available tomorrow, how are you going to get it into your population? Well, you wouldn't want the population just to all accumulate in your clinics, would you? Because obviously if some of them have the infection, they're going to spread it to others. So you'll have to think about how you play out the vaccine within uh, your country in terms of how the vaccine is going to be given to individuals without spreading the disease in any further. Um, Kuwait's not seen as big a reduction in its GDP and is predicted to see a much lower impact on its GDP. Um, but there's already, your prime minister has already said that um, because of the particular health issues amongst the migrant population and their um, uh, uh, social living issues, which lead to spread of contagion, he wants to recalibrate your workforce uh, to get it down from 70% migration rates to 30% uh, of migrants in your workforce. That's a huge, huge recalibration within your country. So my conclusions are essentially uh, we're still in the pandemic. It's going to take a long, long time to see what the efficient responses are. We don't have the data. The testing is uh, increasing, but it's not systematic at all. The lockdowns are probably worthwhile in most countries and should be re-implemented as, as, uh, as, as often as possible. I think there are interdependencies. COVID's come along at a time when we had a long-term debt crisis. I think for Kuwait in particular, the external constraints are going to be oil prices are continually going to fall. We're going to see um, maybe you can adjust volume through OPEC ag agreements, but I still think that the oil price will fall. That will affect your revenues. And obviously the demand for oil will fall if you see in the uh, larger countries in the world hits on their economy of 
uh, anywhere between 10 and 13 percent, and we're not going to recover for at least five years. So I think that the healthcare systems, uh, we still don't know what the best uh, ways of adapting are. As I said, we've got uh, fairly good information at the country level, but not at the local level. The local level modeling of hospital capacity constraints is extremely difficult. And I think we're uh, in a, a structural change within our economies as a result of COVID. I'll stop there. I've gone 10 minutes over time and I'm happy to take um, questions. Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor McGuire. A very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, perhaps if you allow me to ask uh, the first question, I have, I have gathered some questions here in our audience uh, in the chat flow are adding some questions. You mentioned uh, in your conclusion and throughout your presentation something about uh, how uh, less fragmented healthcare systems uh, seem to perform better than fragmented ones. Um, what other qualities, high level qualities, can you uh, compare and contrast? Uh, uh, qualities that were found in healthcare systems that performed better, that outperformed? Um, so the less fragmented systems, and I'm thinking here particularly of the Latin American systems and some parts of the US system. Interestingly, um, uh, consumption levels in the US generally went down by um, about 30%, um, 25%. 40% of the fall in the consumption was in the private hospital sector. So people were not arriving at private hospitals because uh, the private hospitals has, had either closed down their wards to stop people coming in to infect their populations or had, um, had uh, recalibrated to COVID patients, but only patients who had private healthcare insurance initially at least. Okay, so, so if you have patients who have different payment uh, structures, then they'll go to different hospitals, obviously different treatments, and some may find that their access is blocked to particular treatments. And there's some evidence, and it's very slight evidence just now, very light evidence, that particularly amongst the poor black population in the south and west of the United States, um, even although they had COVID, they weren't going to seek attention, the medical attention, because they didn't have uh, insurance coverage. So if you have a fragmented system in terms of payment, and fragmented in terms of its healthcare delivery, it affects access to the system. And that access, of course, uh, means that you um, you are, it's, it's, a, it's a virulent virus, so you're, you're just going to spread the disease. For other fragmented systems, um, some of the systems in, um, in uh, South, South America, um, and I'm not thinking so much of the the Chile and Ecuador or Peruvian systems because they're quite they're quite um, well integrated now. But the Brazilian system, for example, they just didn't have the capacity in the private sector to cope with the increased uh, influx of patients, even if they had private insurance. That doesn't mean that the um, the less fragmented or the more integrated systems were necessarily doing a lot better. But it does, also, it does mean that if you've got an integrated healthcare system, you can move your staff much more easily. So staff shortages have come out of this as being one of uh, uh, the many issues which have arisen. And um, as I said in passing in the, the presentation, um, the st nursing staff shortages for uh, critical care nurses or intensive care nurses uh, has been shown to be uh, fairly extreme. And yet within the UK, for example, and in Germany, and to a lesser extent in France, they were able to move nurses from uh, lower levels of treatment up to critical care uh, treatment very quickly. So where you've got more integration within the system, you can move staff around uh, the system a bit better as well. Um, Uh, thank you for, for that, for explaining that, Professor McGuire. Perhaps I can move on to a, a question for the sake of time, a question from one of our attendees. We have um, one of the earlier questions when you were talking about case uh, uh, mortality rate. Um, we had a question from Farouk asking about uh, the, the estimates for IFR 
compared to CFR. Perhaps you know what uh, what he means by this. And then uh, uh, linking that to the, the the random testing that happened in Kuwait, as you know, we ramped up our testing um, from 2000 a day up to about five thousand a day, back down to 2,500 these days. Um, What's your uh, take on the on the on the local Kuwaiti scheme? And, and and the last part of Farouk's question is about herd immunity. Perhaps you okay, can. Okay, so on. the I think I covered the CFR IFR difference with the example uh, case fatality rate and infectious fatality rate. So the example of um, having a hundred patients in a hospital, and then uh, sorry, a hundred patients who have who have the uh, who are infected. 10 go into the hospital and one dies, the others don't go in. So you get a difference between the case fatality rate and the infection fatality rate um, because people aren't being tested in that example. Um, but even with testing, as I kept coming back to, you have to have systematic testing and repeat testing. And it has to be um, the, even the level of repeat testing has to be quite frequent um, given the disease structure. So um, even if you're doing um, random sampling in the population and testing at that point, which I think is a good starting point, um, you still need to do repeat testing quite frequently to do that. Um, and of course, the test rates are uh, easier to, um, are, are going to be more truthful if you're operating under a system of lockdown as well. So within Kuwait, I think their, um, the, their lockdown was fairly early, maybe reflecting what was happening in Iran. I don't know why, but uh, it was a good idea to lock down early. The testing has been, um, I believe, I could be wrong in this, mainly random sample testing within the population, and I think that's good, but I don't know about the frequency. And you'd have to have really free, high frequency in your testing to ensure that you're getting the true case fatality rates. Um, what does uh, seem to me to be um, happening, and maybe it's a, a reflection of the testing in Kuwait, testing and tracing capabilities in Kuwait, is and the lockdown, is that your uh, number of cases still to be seems to be fairly high, but uh, your case fatality rate is quite low. So it's maybe the case that you're um, either it's reflective of a younger population or it's reflective of catching people earlier in the disease um, and maybe get better treatment into them. Um, we have a question on determining the labor need uh, of the health uh, the healthcare system. Um, we we'll asked uh, what suggestions would you have for the Kuwait's Ministry of Health to focus on in terms of determining the uh, the labor needs? Um, because you touched upon um, uh, the, the ER, the, the nurses, the support uh, staff, I guess. Um, suggestions you, might you have for us? So the, I think there's a number of things. I mean, I know that you're trying to change your payment systems, that you're trying to build capacity. Um, both physical capacity and uh, human capital capacity in Kuwait. Um, I think that it's, it's obvious that what's really important in building any physical capacity is that there's um, built into the hospital sector is excess capacity. So it might be that um, Usually you'd, you'd say that excess capacity is just a costly thing. So you're holding capacity in excess of normal demand. So it's empty beds, for example, right? So you'd think, well, that's a, that's a costly thing. You're just holding an empty bed. But those systems, for example, Germany, who had large numbers of beds per population and had excess capacity in beds were uh, able to ease the flow of patients into these beds quicker. So that's one thing. The first thing is when you're building physical capacity, try to plan out what level of capacity is appropriate and then add on an appropriate excess for uh, any of these. And you're a wealthy country, so you can afford this, right? 
Um, the second thing is um, the human capital, obviously, the training um, of uh, physicians. Uh, you've got to train more physicians in Kuwait and keep them in Kuwait. Don't let them leave. So that means that you have to pay them uh, probably more, although they're pretty well paid in Kuwait. And then you have to look at the specializations that you're uh, uh, trying to service as well. I also think personally, uh, for a country the size of Kuwait, I'd go for um, public insurance and public sector uh, delivery only. I wouldn't allow private sector delivery because it does fragment the system. Although your, um, your Minister of Health uh, does regulate the private sector, I, I still think it's grown too fast. And then the, the, so as well as trying to get the appropriate uh, specialties, you've got you know, certain disease needs that we know, cardiac, diabetes, um, some of these diseases need more specialist care than others. Um, and then I'd also go for uh, uh, specialization within nursing as well. And I know that you've been experimenting with uh, community care as well. So uh, some sort of integration across the hospital and community care would be important. Lots to do. Now, there was a question about capacity. And if you're not familiar with the, the, the field hospital details, the, the question might not be relevant. But there was an increase in, in capacity by um, the, the Kuwait oil sector contributed the construction uh, funding of the uh, field hospital. Um, might you be able to, to touch on this uh, increase in capacity? So, so I, I don't know much about the field hospitals. I do know that you brought in quite a lot of um, extra capacity by building bed capacity quite quickly within Kuwait as a response to COVID. Uh, we did the same in the UK. We didn't actually need uh, as, as many field beds, let's call them, as real beds, uh, hospital beds. But that was uh, because of um, uh, two things. First of all, um, the predictions of how the pandemic would pan out were um, vastly overrated initially, overestimates, and that seems to be the well as the UK. But the second thing that happened in the UK, and I don't know if this has happened in Kuwait, is that, um, as I said in the talk, uh, uh, individuals with cancer or with coronary heart disease or diabetes stopped um, going to the hospital sector or into healthcare because they were at risk and frightened of being infected, obviously. And so the the um, so these people just didn't seek out treatment either. So um, once you're hit with a, a a pandemic, it's very difficult to really deal with. Um, reallocating aspects and that's why capacity is built as an emergency but really you've got to plan into that it, the model which i've been involved in for uh, this major hospital in london really brought home to me how difficult it is to get local data on a real-time basis for hospitals so even in looking at capacity under normal circumstances Usually it's a junior doctor goes around the whole hospital at night, counts how many beds are empty and says that's our occupancy rate. So, you know, that's the level of, um, of detail that we're dealing with under normal circumstances. Things have got to improve. We've got to have data on a real time basis. We've got to have data which um, relates to disease treatments. We've got to have data which relates to payments you know our lengths of stay longer in some areas because they're being paid for getting higher revenue there's let alone the pandemic we have very little understanding at the hospital level as to what's going on in terms of admission and discharge policies so another thing for the minister of health to do would be to set out some uh, protocols and admission and discharge policies that would be a great start okay and um, um, a question from uh, Ali, uh, you, you were speaking about modeling, and I, I think he's talking about uh, modeling hospital flow or operations, uh, hospital operations. Well, you showed a few flow charts and he talked about the modeling. He may be asking about the specific model. You did say it was publicly available. 
he asked about what would be the best uh, modeling hospital flow for operations with tools which we have in Kuwait. And this is probably also linked to the data availability um, okay, point that you I just mean, raised. Um, I'd, I'd, you have my email, so I'm happy for you to share my email with them and I can put them in touch with, um, well, through myself, I can give them the model. The, the reason we built the model was twofold. One was uh, we wanted to use software that everybody had access to. So a lot of these operational research models are based on discrete event software, which is used by engineers. It's very expensive. Not everybody has it. We built it in Excel and we built it in Excel in a way which anybody can use basically. So as long as you know what you're trying to do, and that's, a, that's quite a difficult start, as long as you know what you're trying to do and what data you have, even if you have gaps in the data, you can make guesses and then you can put in distributional guesses for your probabilities and you can, in a matter of three Excel spreadsheets, you can get a fairly complex model going. We found, as I keep repeating, getting the actual data from the hospital was difficult for a number of reasons. First of all, you're doing it on a time basis. Every night we needed updated data. Secondly, it's patient data, so it's confidential. So we had to anonymize it somehow. And then thirdly, we were looking at how capacity constraints were moving because the hospital itself was also adjusting as we were modeling what it was doing, moving staff one way or closing beds or uh, saying, okay, we're going to have a stop on our do not resuscitate rules or, you know, they were changing as we were trying to model it. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not um, a non-complex problem as you gather, but we were trying to make the, the actual modeling both uh, as, as easy to access and as easy to use as possible. So I'm happy to share that with anybody. Thank you, thank you very much. We do look forward, uh, I, I will uh, share with those interested, I will share, download and share that model if, uh, um, <clears throat> if so we do have uh, a question related to the field hospital, uh, um, but uh, it says with at the same time we have it that smart. And perhaps until I understand that question, let me move to a question that uh, is is general but goes to the to the heart of the matter. Aisha asked uh, about how Kuwait managed the crisis, and of course there are many dimensions to this. How it managed it um, from the healthcare system, from from life, uh, economy, um, <clears throat> society, uh, so many aspects. Well. But she's asking um, uh, how. I suppose when she asked, or ha did we just spend a ton of money on nothing? I suppose she's talking about the trade-off between um uh, doing nothing or how much we did and, 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 and what we we lost by implementing lockdowns or what we gained by spending on what we spent so is there a, and perhaps this can be a, a concluding question since we are a few minutes away from that can you give us a, a, a big picture evaluation you did say that the loss the loss in gdp that kuwait would sustain uh because of lockdown uh, is worth uh, the, 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 the the lives you would save and what you would save and and, and, and when you uh, avoid or when you avert um, more COVID cases. So I understand the balance you've struck there, but can you give us a, a big picture? Have we managed this crisis well um, I, compared to what? We well, look, I, I I was asked to talk about healthcare systems, but we're right in the middle of this crisis, so we don't really know about the efficient healthcare system. Also, I'm not. A medically trained doctor so we know that you know putting people on ventilators too soon was a bad thing we know that certain treatments don't work we know that uh, this is a head-to-toe virus it affects your sense of smell to blue toe it can go anywhere once you've got some so sort of severity we as I kept stressing we don't even have data on the case fatality rate really in terms of what Kuwait did and, and also it's an infectious disease, right? So it's gonna affect society. It's going, we have no idea about the counterfactual, what would have happened if you hadn't have done anything. However, I would have said from my little understanding of this disease, 
Kuwait did exactly the right thing in implementing its lockdown very early on. And you can get a feel for kind of what happened if you look at some of these FT graphs again. There's a little kick up in your cases and your mortality rate right at the end. I think that's to do with Eid. That's a, a social thing, right? That's a sort of cultural social thing. It's nothing to do with the healthcare that you're offering people. So the lockdown is absolutely vital and important. I think that, um, you know, and you're still doing that. You've, you've opened up your airports, but you're uh, stopping flights from certain countries. And I think that's absolutely right as well, because as we saw in the earlier graphs, this hasn't gone away. Um, and you're a country that relies on migrant labor. So your migrant labor were obviously pockets of contagion, clusters of contagion. So again, you're probably right in stopping and also um, uh, containing migrant labor in that way, you know, because this, if not, this is just going to spread without the country. So I would have said that the real um, positive thing that the, the Kuwaitis did is lock down early. We'll never know the counterfactual, but I, I certainly believe in my heart of hearts that that was your best policy um, and you're still gaining benefit from it. But it's a social disease. It's not about health care as such. It's about the movement, interactions of people. Labor, clinical, non clinical tasks. But as you mentioned, uh, your focus was on the health care. I'm completely to take any questions. Um, if, you, if you send them on by email, I'm happy to address them by email. I would I would like to do that. I'm I'm going to compile some questions that that overlap perhaps with the ones we have some questions specific to your model. Um, uh, but with this, uh, Professor McGuire, I, I I thank you on behalf of KFAS and all of our attendees for taking the time uh, to join us uh, to give us your uh, assessment um, to share with us your ex uh, expertise. Uh, and I would like to thank our attendees uh, for their time, their attention. Uh, and I do welcome you all, uh, 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 starting with you first, Professor McGuire, welcome you all to join us for our next uh, KFAS links. It's on the first Wednesday of every month. Um, and we hope to see you uh, next uh, next month. Professor McGuire, do you have any closing remarks? Um, uh, no, us? just thank you very much. and. Uh... As humans, we're all in this together, so let's try and beat it together. But thank you, and do write to me if you have questions. Thank you very much for the invite. Thank you, everyone, once again. And uh, we remain uh, available and in touch via our, uh, nor our usual uh, social media channels. And uh, we have uh, pasted the link to our YouTube uh, channel also to see this video again. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And we hope to see you Thank in you. our next day. Good evening, Mr. McGuire. Thank you. Good evening.